Hello and welcome in to the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. And today and every post game for KU football going forward, I will be joined by Kevin Flaherty, who covers Kansas a little bit for us, but also does a lot of more national college football and college basketball writing for 24-7 Sports. Kevin, how has the start of your Saturday morning been so far? You know, it's uh, it's been pretty great. It, it feels... You know, like week zero is always, you know, just sort of that wet your appetite a little bit. Like college football hasn't really, really started. But now this week you get the full Thursday slate of games. Mm-hmm. You get the Friday slate of games. You get college game day and all the different pregame shows and everything. And and then you get some huge games today. I mean, you get like yeah. Ohio State, Notre Dame mm-hmm. and, and some stuff like that. So. I, honestly, from a from a college football standpoint and everything else, I'm not sure I could be any happier. How about you? I, I'm pumped. It feels like college football season. I, you know, yeah. I had a, as I was writing some post game stuff like 30 minutes ago. I had college game day on in the background, and it just feels like it. And I love the Thursday slate. That was so much fun yeah. watching West Virginia and Pitt. I even caught a little bit of the the Purdue Penn State game, and that was a good appetizer for what we saw last night. I was, you know, for KU beating Tennessee Tech. 56 to 10 last night. I was up in the press box. Kevin, you were down in Memorial Stadium uh, there as a supporter. Um, I, I want to start here. I'm curious for you, what was kind of the, the game day atmosphere like for you? Kind of the first true, real kind of po- post COVID kind of setup for KU in terms of the tailgating and everything. So, yeah. what was kind of your takeaway and what was the experience like for you? Yeah, you know, it, it's. Funny, I thought the the game day experience was was really cool. You know, I I remember um, walking around before the game um, with uh, with my college roommate. Actually, we uh, we attended the game together and was was just kind of walking the hill and seeing all the different tailgates and everything. You know, uh, burgers and brats were in the air and all of that. But also, you know, when we were walking over by the football complex. You know, Travis Goff walked by the Kansas athletic director and he had, you know, just ear to ear smile, I think, from the the energy and everything that you saw there. And then once you got to the stadium, it, it was a pretty good crowd. You know, it was a pretty good sized crowd. It was a very energetic crowd. You know, I think a lot of fans were were excited. It, it was kind of funny, you know, leaving after the game, some of the conversations that you just kind of tend to overhear, you know, hey. Hey, we're going bowling. Hey, you know, whatever else. And so it, it was a, it was a really, a really cool uh, kind of experience. And I know um, from an attendance standpoint, Michael, that was, uh, that, that was pretty strong. I feel like for, for a Kansas opener. It was, and it wasn't necessarily a crowd that got there, you know, 15 minutes before kick. It was a lot of it, you know, I think by probably the second drive of the game, Yep. When the stadium kind of hit its fullest, but the announced attendance was 34,902. And that's the, the largest crowd case had in a season opener since 2014. So you're looking at, you know, eight years, almost you know, getting close to a decade in terms of, you know, precedence. So I thought that was really good. Uh, I thought that in general, the crowd made a lot of noise. And I think that's positive. I think you, as game week kind of progressed, you heard maybe a little bit more and more about, all right, you know, the crowd might be, pretty good this weekend you know you never really know what necessarily that means giving sure. you know it's a holiday weekend maybe people are going out of town it, it's not really a great opponent but I thought overall it was really good and overreactions are fun after the first game of the season I, I've loved you know <laughs> message board and and Twitter yeah. and, and all of it and I'm sure we'll get to some of those overreaction questions a little bit later on but I, I want to start here with you Kevin um going to the first quarter Personally, I don't think you could have asked for a better first quarter from Kansas. Like they came out of the blocks playing really, really well. And I just don't think that's been the case in some of these season openers in the past. Obviously, last year's a little bit of a different situation, considering the fact that the coaching staff didn't really get a spring and it was a much more challenging start. But even going back to Les Miles' this time, David Beatty for sure, you know, these FCS teams have given KU some issues, and that just wasn't the case on Friday night. Yeah, I th- I think you make a good point because you know, what's that old coaching cliche, basically, you know, don't let them hang around. They they'll start to believe they can play with you. Yeah. And Kansas comes out, you get the three and out right away. You go down, score a touchdown, you get another three and out, you score a touchdown. And, and so, you know, to have that kind of start. And, and I felt like, you know, 
it, it was the sort of thing you really wanted to see, I, I think, as, as much as anything. You know, mm-hmm. we, we had talked a little bit before the game about how the important thing was, hey, you, you want to win and you want to stay healthy. Yeah. But at the same time, those were the, the needs, so to speak. The wants, I feel like, you wanted to play well up front. You really wanted it to look like, hey, we're playing an FCS team and we are better than they are and we are better than they are up front. And I think that that was really one of the things that that stood out about this game. And we knew Tennessee Tech was not a South Dakota, right? Like mm-hmm. even with no. FCS, like Tennessee Tech is is not a great FCS team. I think they were five and six last year. Um, and, and so when you when you look at that, it's a game that you would hope that Kansas would go in and, and sort of establish its dominance. But this is also a team that, you know, Kansas was favored to beat by what, 28, 30 points was the line right around there. Um, and, and so if you just look at, hey, the line is the expectation, if you if you clear it or whatever, then, then Kansas had a really strong outing. Yeah, and I think a couple good points there. I think for me, the defensive line, the way that, that group yeah. started the game was really good because obviously I wrote about it on the website and we talked on the podcast too, but they've had some scheme changes. And it was good to see that from the get-go, the guys were kind of getting it. You know, you get off the ball, you get up the field. And there were some gaps there, I think, in the run game as the, as the game progressed. But I think from the start, you just saw it. And I, I got the tackle for loss numbers here. 12 total tackles for loss, five sacks from that defensive line group. I think that's a really good start. Of course, you take into account the competition, but you have to take care of business. And I thought that was huge. Um, For me, let's talk about Lonnie Phelps. (laughs) That was fun. That was reminiscent of a Dorrance Armstrong type of, I'm going to come out and kind of dominate. Now, it took him a little while to get going, right? He wasn't super Mm -hmm. impactful in the first quarter. I think he had two tackles, but then all of a sudden there, second quarter, um, you know, Nathan Swaffer, our, our staff writer, wrote about it. But Jim Panico's kind of gave him a tip on the sideline like, hey, tweak this and you'll be able to get going. And sure enough, he did. And, man, he's fun to watch. Like that was the first game getting to see him. And like, man, he's a good player. Well, and I thought it was interesting. One of the things that schematically you and I have talked about on the podcast is the fact that Lonnie Phelps was – was really effective at Miami, Ohio in two man game. You know, when you would twist him with a defensive tackle, when you would slant him inside and do different things like that. I think one of the things that I wanted to see was one, would they run some of that? They did. Mm -hmm. But two, but two, the other thing that I wanted to see was, Hey, when he's just lined up and flat going against the tackle, is he going to win that way too? Do you have to scheme a win for him? Or is he going to win on his own? And again, like you said, it it is Tennessee Tech. And and we'll probably say that phrase, it's Tennessee Tech, about 34,000, you know, more more times. But at the same time, he won those battles. You know, when he was going one-on-one with the tackle, he was either getting the edge or he was forcing the tackle upfield enough to where he could push back inside. And, And I thought that was a really encouraging part you talked about the tackles for loss and especially the play early. I thought the defensive tackles were outstanding. Mm-hmm. And I thought the number yeah. of times it's not necessarily the easiest spot to play against a team that runs so much option. And I thought the number of times Tennessee tech handed the ball off and the running back was having to make a move, you know, two or three yards deep in the backfield was pretty high. And I, I thought, you know, Lonnie Phelps, had this terrific performance. I think the other guy that, that really stood out to me, I mean, Jeremy Robinson played well, but the other guy that, that jumped out to me was we've talked about Caleb Sampson potentially having that all big 12 potential in a defense where he can get up field, where he can be a one gap guy. What, what did you see for, from Caleb Sampson from your viewpoint? I thought he was good. I mean, if you're going to rank kind of the defensive tackles, you know, I I think Eddie Wilson and Caleb Taylor were up top, but I think Caleb Sampson had a really good game. And he's one of these guys that is just kind of quiet. You know, he's not one of these rah, rah, you know, type of players where you notice him celebrating a bunch like Lonnie Phelps was, but (laughs) he's one of these guys that just kind of quietly puts together some solid performances. I thought he was really good. 
I think you go to the second level, those linebackers were fun to watch. And oh, yeah. I'm going to have to highlight this at some point, but they were putting Craig Young in space a lot. And I yeah. thought that was really interesting because I was curious of kind of what the alignment would look like. Obviously, Craig Young played safety at Ohio State and now plays linebacker, playing that, that strong side linebacker spot. I thought he was good. I thought Talon Berryhill was good. I thought Rich Miller was good. Um, even, heck, Eric Gilliard got an interception. Like, who would have thought that Eric Gilliard, the guy who was tabbed as a good run stopper but not maybe the best in passing coverage, is the guy that gets KU's first interception? I, I thought the front seven in general was very dominant. And i say it again the level of competition, but sure. I think the cohesiveness that you saw from that unit was really, really encouraging. And of course you have to, a good test next week against West Virginia, but I think just to have that type of production, have that type of performance, the way they were rotating guys. I mean, Kevin, there are times where like, you know, obviously mid drive, they'll do it, but it seemed like guys would get two plays and then come out and then two plays and come out. Like they were rotating a ton and the players post game seemed to really like that, how they could just go all out for mm -hmm. however many snaps they could. And then when they needed a rest, they tapped their helmet. And the way they did it was Panagos was on the sideline. Taiwo Onatolu, the defensive ends coach was up in the box and they'd rotate him out. I thought it was really interesting. Like rotation wise, like what'd you see? Because I'm sure as a, as a fan watching it, maybe it looks a little bit different than when you're up in the press box and you're on the same sideline. Sure. Yeah. I think that that was actually something that I really noticed too. And, and it's funny because on one hand we talk about it and say, Oh, you, you won 56 to 10 against Tennessee tech. I think the other thing that I would note is that Kansas rotated heavily throughout starting in the first quarter. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying they won't rotate against other teams, but I feel like the level of rotation you know, could Kansas have won this game and, and put up 70 or 77 points? Yeah, probably. But I also think that it was more worth it for Kansas to get certain guys out there and get them reps, you know, in deciding moments, you know, when the game wasn't 100% out of hand or, or things like that. And I thought I thought that was an interesting thing just to see the way that all, the, all of those guys rolled through. And, and it's funny, you know, you look out there, at certain times in the, in the third and fourth quarters. And, you know, Eric Gilliard ha, has come off the bench and, you know, Lorenzo McCaskill is out there and, and you say, this isn't like it was last year, you know, yeah. with, with the depth, the, you know, the way they were able to rotate through at the corner spots, you know, at safety, you know, you had Jarrett Paul making, you know, all these great plays, you know, in the second half and everything after, you know, I thought OJ Burroughs had a quietly very good game. Um, he's a, he's a fireman, right? Like he, he's, mm -hmm. but he's like a premature fireman. Like he puts mm -hmm. out the fire before it starts. And so, you know, I, I thought, you know, that was something that stood out to me, but you could look pretty much at every position on, on that defense and they did rotate guys offensively as well. And I'm sure we'll get to a certain position in particular here in a minute, but you look at the way that they were able to rotate guys through defensively, and it had to be so encouraging to have guys at all these different levels of the defense rotate through and, and find success. 100%. And I'm going to use this time to segue as we go to the offense. This was a dominant performance. Yep. And had that touchdown not happened, you're looking at Katie's biggest margin of victory, the last Tennessee Tech touchdown to get them to 10 points. Um you're looking at KU's largest margin of victory since they joined the Big 12. That's what I spent so much time of the in the fourth quarter, like looking up the the greatest margins of victory, and I had to go back all the way to 1996, uh, and even further back. I it was still kind of looking, and, and then all of a sudden they scored, and it's like, well, we'll have to do this again. But a few ga game notes here: um, the 56 points most scored in a season opener since when, Kevin? When do you think? I think they just missed against Central Michigan. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, in 2007. I think they yeah. had like 52 in that game. Close. Um, you have to go back 100 know. years. Is it really? You have to go wow. back to 1912 when KU shut out St. Mary's 62 to nothing. I did not know that, that. That was a barn burner, I assure you. Yeah, I, I wish I knew. Um <laughs> And then you go go down the list, right? 56 points, most scored at home 
since that Nebraska game when KU scored 76 points back in 2007. Overall dominant performance. Offensively, let's save the running backs because we'll use we'll get to that in the questions that we have. Sure. Let's go with Jalen Daniels first. I wrote about this heading into the game that he's the guy that I was most interested to watch offensively because a lot of these games for Kansas early on are winnable. First six weeks of the season are when a lot of your winnable games happen. You cannot have a slow start from your quarterback, particularly when you go on the road two out of the first three weeks of the season. And I thought that Jalen Daniels was awesome. Awesome. First half, uh, I think 14 to 15 total, you know, didn't really put the ball in jeopardy, made a lot of really good throws. I thought a couple of them where he extended the play with his legs and then was able to complete passes. I think got one to Luke Grimm. I think he obviously had the one to Quentin Skinner. Um, that was Skinner's first reception uh, as a Jayhawk. Pretty cool moment for him, 56 yards. Um, I thought Jalen Daniels was awesome overall. And the interception, we talked to him post game. He was kind of like, yeah, I got a little confident. was, you know, trying to force it in and didn't think that the, the linebacker was going to be there. And he was, but he kind of seemed like it was one of those where he kind of knew it was a risky throw and still was like, ah, I can do it. Um, but overall, Kevin, for you, like, what do you think of Jalen Daniels? Because I was, I was very impressed. Yeah, because I think. Jalen Daniels, you know, we, we all know about the talent level, you know, right. He's got a terrific arm. I mean, when you look at, when you look at the, the best throws that KU quarterbacks have made in recent memory, you know, a high number of them belong to Jalen Daniels. I mean, he's got that, that arm talent and he's mobile and he's tough and all of those things. I think what I wanted to see, um, and I believe you were right there with me, is the polish, right? Mm -hmm. Because you think of Jalen as a gunslinger, like a, a guy that hangs in until the last minute, you know, has a helmet under his chin and, and, you know, puts the ball out there. And I thought one of the things that was most impressive about him was the polish and the poise that he played with. Like you said, mm -hmm. he didn't put the ball in jeopardy in, until that throw. You know, you look at I think the 14 of 15, I think the only incompletion was that sort of back shoulder fade where, you know, he put the ball in, in the receiver's hands on that fourth yeah, down. Yeah, the fourth down. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it wasn't like you could blame that, you know, on a bad pass. Like he gave his guy a, a chance to catch it. And so when you look at, at how polished he was, when you looked at the decisions he made, and, and it's kind of funny too, um, the pass to Skinner, right? So uh, it, it was like a little bootleg mm -hmm. and the tight end breaks into the clear. And I was like, he's got his tight end for like a real nice little, you know, six or eight yard gain there. And he pulled up and went back and, and I was, I was thinking, okay, like what else does he see? And then you see Quentin Skinner break clear by, by five yards and, and he hits him deep. And, and I think that's the part, that he brings that that a lot of other Kansas quarterbacks don't, right? Like even some of the ones that have been effective, they take that little dump off to the tight end and, and you yeah. know, say, hey, you know, that's that's an eight-yard completion, that's a positive play, et cetera. Jalen Daniels gives you a chance to be explosive. And within that, if he's also protecting the ball and also being accurate and also playing with poise, uh, I really think the the sky is the limit for that kid. I, I really do. Yeah, I love that throw is awesome. And from yeah. my, you know, I like the press box because you get kind of the all 22 look of it. And, you know, I saw Jalen Daniels go back and kind of rear back like he's going to throw it. And I thought he was going to try and force it into Lawrence Arnold on kind of yeah. the, the, the near side um, if you're watching on the TV broadcast. And then all of a sudden you kind of see a guy breaking free and you're kind of like, who is that? And it's like, oh, it's Quentin Skinner, the guy that, all camp, everyone's like, that's exactly what he does. Yep. Like that's that's what everyone talked about was he's a guy that can break the top off the defense. Man, he's a I think Andy Cornuck, he called him a grass chewer because of the yep. way he just eats up strides and, and can eat up ground. And I, I'm just super impressed by him. I think that that's a huge development if he can be someone that provides that deep threat for you. Because you look at the other guys, right? Like Lawrence Arnold more of a 50-50 guy, uh, better as a possession receiver almost. Luke Grimm's a really good guy in the slot, really good route runner. Uh, but you don't really have a guy that's going to take the top off the defense, especially yeah. with Trevor Wilson suspended indefinitely. And so for Quentin Skinner to do that, I thought was really huge. And then obviously someone like Kevin Terry showing up as well. He was someone yeah. that you know this time last year was kind of getting some buzz in camp but got hurt and didn't really play. 
he had two catches, I want to say. Those were his first two college catches as well. So you've got multiple guys now that in the first game of the season showed they can do it. Now, it'd be very interested to see, can they get open against Big 12 cornerbacks and sure. Power 5 cornerbacks in general because you basically have you know 11 Power 5 games left this season. Um, yeah, I thought the wide receiver room probably surpassed my expectations a little bit. I I just didn't really know what to expect. And we're not even talking about Doug Amillion, who played a little bit more in the second half, not as much in the first half. But um, wide receiver-wise, what do you think? And we'll blend that in and talk about the tight ends too. Sure, yeah. I think that when you looked at – with the way the coaches were talking about the receiver room, right, was we don't have a wide receiver one at this point. We don't have yeah. – you know, a, a Des Briscoe type guy that, hey, you know, this guy is going to, you know, go out and catch seven passes for 100 yards on a given thing. But they said this group can be really effective if guys make the most of the opportunities that they get. And I thought from that perspective, it was really encouraging, you know, on, on big downs, even when they had third downs, you had guys, you know, getting open by a pretty significant margin. And like you said, it's going to be different against Big 12 competition. It is. But I think the the thing that you look at is w- when you're looking at what you want to see from Tennessee Tech, like I think the, the main takeaway I have from the game in general, and this relates to wide receivers, is Kansas did what it was supposed to against Tennessee Tech. And I know – that sounds like like it doesn't sound satisfying, right? Like you're not saying, oh, it was brilliant or whatever, you know, but that's what you're supposed to do. And I mean that in a good way. Like that's a positive. Like Kansas hasn't typically done what it's supposed to do in those situations. And so when you looked at, at that, and I felt like the wide receivers did what they were supposed to do in that situation. When it was, say, a third and eight, you'd have a guy breaking open across the middle of the field and presenting Jalen Daniels with a really nice target to find for for a big completion when they wanted to go over the top. You had Quentin Skinner getting open over the top when even on the the goal line fade that they threw in, and, you know, that was an interesting play call, I thought. I'm not not a goal line fade guy on fourth down because I feel like, if your wide receiver is good, he maybe gives you a little bit better than 50 50 chance to get that. And I feel like you have to have a play in your playbook. That's better than 50 50 chance to get two yards. Yeah, I agree. Um, But anyways, if you're going to throw the fade, it was well thrown. The receiver made a good play on the ball. It was, was it Arnold that made the play on that? Yeah, it was. Um, he made it, he made a good play on it. He didn't quite come down with it, but he did what he was supposed to do. And so I think when you, when you look at those, there's a lot of encouraging moments. Tight end was kind of fun because I thought the number one thing for those guys, and I think, I feel like people forget this is you got to block, right? Yeah. right? Like KU wants to run the ball, like first and foremost, and that is going to set up the other things. And I, I thought they had a good game blocking. I thought Jared Casey on the Devin Neal touchdown run, you know, had a terrific sort of blocks and seal off there. Uh, Mason Fairchild didn't have a bad game blocking the ball or blocking, uh, caught a pass. Um, they didn't use the tight ends a whole lot in the passing game. I would expect that to change, you know, when you look forward it, into the schedule, I think, if you were going to ask me with that pass catching group, like what's the adjustment moving forward, I would guess that the receivers are going to have a little bit harder time getting open. And I think that the tight ends are going to start getting utilized more in part because of that. What, what did you think of that, of that tight end group as well? Yeah. You hit on Jared Casey. He picked up, picked up where he left off of last year, not necessarily in the passing game, but in, in terms of helping KU open running lanes, like there were so yeah. many plays where, he was taking out a defensive end, someone at the second level. Like, I thought he was really, really good. And that's positive because, uh, you know, I wasn't convinced by what I saw from Tavita Noah. Uh, I thought he got thrown around a little bit out there, which isn't great for someone that looks like more of an offensive lineman than a tight end. I thought it was interesting that Trevor Cardell didn't play much. Um, I, yeah. I was just looking as you were talking there, and he's on the participation report, so we played. Um, yeah. I just didn't see him out there that much. So that'll be something I'll have to ask about this week. Um, all right. 
It is time. All right. To talk about the most fun topic of all, and we'll get into some of our questions here now. Um, I want to start with one that I got. I'm going to shorten the question a little bit, but the person was concerned about Devin Neal's lack of carries. And let me pull it up right here next to me. Um, this is just a crazy stat line to look at. Um, <clears throat> uh, four carries, yep. 108 yards, two touchdowns. <laughs> I, it's just it's just funny to look at that. Um, the person, the gist of the question is, do you read into Devin Neal's lack of carries? And is this something that's going to keep up? And let's just specifically talk about Devin Neal because we'll get to the rest of the group in a second because there's a lot to digest. But with Devin Neal, are you reading into his lack of carries yesterday? I don't think so. And, and we'll get into some of this on the on the next one too. But uh, I think, you know, they didn't need to give Devin Neal a lot of carries. You know, Devin was, was really effective with the carries he got. Um, and, and even beyond that, you know, you were – you were winning by a significant margin. And, and so I, I don't think you read anything into it. He started the game. He and Kai Thomas were both out there in that diamond formation. Tory Lachlan too, right? Yeah, like Tory yeah. Lachlan was the, was the third back um, in, in that little diamond that they came out in. But he started the game. You know, he was effective out there. I, I don't think you really draw too many conclusions about, about that moving forward. Yeah, I, I agree. It's early in the season, and the last thing you want to do is give your your star running back twenty carries against a team that isn't good. Like that's just, you don't want to add an unnecessary wear to a player at a position that takes a lot of wear, regardless of what happens. So I don't read into it. I also got asked if they should redshirt him. No, uh, <laughs> you don't redshirt running backs really. Like if they're good enough, they'll play. It's like Puka, right? You don't redshirt Puka. Like you don't redshirt Devin Neal. You don't. Like the reason that a lot of these guys redshirted in the past, like someone like Savion Morrison, someone like Kai Thomas, is because they were that programs that had a Devin Neal, right? With the guy that was going to take a lot of the carries. Daniel Hyshaw redshirted because he got hurt. Like, so I just don't, I don't see that happening. Now let's get to the rest of the running back carries. Um, sure. I'll read this off to you real quick. So Savion Morrison got the most carries with eight, yep. then Daniel Hyshaw with five and those might be the most electric five carries I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and then you had Devin Neal with four. Oh, Kai Thomas had seven under Savion Morrison. He's a little further down cause he didn't gain as many yards, but um, so yeah, right now it's Morrison with the most, then Thomas, then Daniel Hyshaw, then Neal and then Lachlan. So overall looking forward, like do you expect it to be this spread out? Like, what do you think? Uh, I think they'd like to, ride the hot hand to some extent, mm -hmm. but I also think that that hot hand a lot of times is going to be Devin Neal. And I think that when you look at a game like last night's, if it happened this next week, let's say against West Virginia, they're not going to cut Devin Neal off at, at four carries. If he's got 108 yards on, yeah. on those four carries, he is the hot hand at that point. And so he's going to continue to get the ball. They're going to keep them all fresh, but I also think that, yeah, there could be some games where where maybe Daniel Hyshaw has 11 carries. There might be some where he has four because maybe Savion's having a little bit more success. I think with Kai Thomas, the frustrating thing was, for whatever reason, uh, his carries weren't especially well blocked. He was yeah. having to, he he was uh, he was not getting the opportunity. I feel like that that some of the other guys were, and, and I thought. Thomas was really impressive in those carries for getting as much as he did, yeah. you know, with, with the blocking that, that he had on those plays. And, and I would expect, I, I thought that was why Thomas wound up with, with seven was sort of even near the end of the game. They were kind of like, okay, let's, let's get him another carry or two. Let's find him something positive to build on it. And I felt like that was, was kind of a theme of last night's game was that they wanted they wanted to give each guy something positive and they wanted to to have everybody operating at, at a certain level and Devin Neal was that guy you know from the start and so you could say okay Devin's playing well let's give those carries to to someone else mm -hmm. um how do you see the, the running back carries kind of shaking out as we go into West Virginia and maybe even down the season. Yeah, I think it'd be similar to that. You, you ride the hot hand. What I thought was interesting is the way they did it. 
this wasn't all right, Devin gets a carry, and then Sevion gets a carry, and then Daniel yeah. gets a carry. It was all right, this is Devin Neal's drive. All right, this yeah. is Sevion's drive. And they'll come out for a play or two because you don't want him on the field, you know, all whatever seven, eight plays of a drive. But I thought that was really interesting. The way that they went about managing that. And that's something that Daniel Hyshaw said after the game was that something that they've kind of worked on is that you're going to get in a rhythm over the course of a drive. You're going to get your first two carries, you know, feel it out. And then, you know, then they'll take you out for the next drive and make sure that you're fresh for when you come back in for whenever that next drive happens to be. Um, I want to give a shout out to Daniel Hyshaw. Like, <laughs> he I, he, he like, took two lives. He took two lives. It's great. And I asked him about it. I asked him about, so for those who didn't see on his first touchdown run, he scores, takes like three steps and just goes and hits an opposing Tennessee tech player and just hits them. Like usually you'll see like a defensive back come in and try and hit a running back late or a wide receiver late. It was the opposite. Like he went out of his way to go crack somebody. I asked him about that. He was like, yeah, I'm tired of hitting other people. Or I was tired of hitting my teammates. I wanted to hit other people. <laughs> and then later in the game, right, he's on the, the far sideline and just tries to truck somebody. Like, I love that. I'm here for that because I just – the physicality. And I think that's a lot of what Lance Lapple wants his team to be is a physical, tough team. Mm. And I think Daniel Hyshaw exemplifies it. So, I, man, I had so much fun watching him. And I love the three running back set too. You're going to see a lot more of that. I'm very confident of that. I'm interested that they only did that once to start the game. I thought that I was think they, I think they came out with it in the second half. Did they? Too, yeah. Okay. I, I thought that was sending a message that we're going to do this, and you're going to see that a lot, and they're going to have some creative stuff off of that too, and that's all I can actually say about that. But um, <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, another question here is, if Key play like that against a Power 5 team, what would the result have been? And this comes from uh, at KU Tracker on Twitter, and we had so many Devin Neal and running backs questions that I can't really – give one person a, a shout out for it but um yeah how, how do you think this game was sh shooken out or shaken out if this was a let's say duke you know against a team like duke i, I think last night's performance might might have been good enough to to win that game by by a touchdown maybe maybe a little more and i know some people are like oh my gosh like what's but I think when you're playing against teams of similar or, or you know if we even say what happens if they did it against Texas Tech or, or whatever, you know, or better talent level, a lot of the little mistakes add up, right? Like you block a guy, but maybe your angle isn't quite right. And it didn't matter as much last night. And so that that helps. And, and to be fair, like Kansas is going to get significantly better. When Kansas plays Duke here in a few weeks, Kansas will be better than it yeah. is right now. And, and I thought – you know, one of the really good things about the game was, like we said, they won, they were healthy. The other thing is, is I thought there were some teachable moments. You know, I thought when you look at like the Kai Thomas runs that we were talking about where maybe the blocking wasn't quite there, it wasn't like it was a jailbreak, right? Like it was, you know, one or two guys not quite getting where they needed to be or, or not quite getting the angle right or whatever else. And, and I think that's instructive because it's not like they got blown off the ball, but those are the things that add up when yeah. you're playing against teams that, that have a bigger competition level. I do think Kansas is better than Duke and, and Duke played uh temple last night. I think one 30 to nothing. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and so when you, when you look at, at those two teams together, I do think Kansas is better than Duke. But at the same time, I, I think with the way the offense played last night, and I know this is going to sound crazy to some people, it was probably a B minus game from an execution standpoint. It wasn't it wasn't an A game in terms of, hey, you know, if you played like this against Oklahoma, you're still gonna move the ball because you're executing so well, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's what I consider an A game is basically hey, the other team's out here, but it really doesn't matter because we're doing what we're supposed to do. And I don't think they hit that. And so I, I think if you put them against a Power 5 team the way they played, I thought the defense was pretty good. There were 
you know, a couple little missed assignments here and there. It's tough to tell with the defense, I think, Michael, because yeah. you're playing an option team that you overmatch, you know, physically. And they played their assignments well, but I'm just saying a lot of opponents are going to present different kinds of challenges than, than what that Tennessee Tech did. When you play, when you play Texas Tech, they're going to put the ball in the air 55 times. And we didn't get a clue yesterday, really, as to what KU's defense will look like against a team that's going to put the ball in the air 55 times. Yeah, we'll hit on West Virginia at the end, but that'll be a good test for the defensive backs group as a whole. Um, offensively, you know, I, I think this is – if the game play like this against Duke, they'd be in the game. And I think yeah. they, they'd have a really good shot of winning it. Um, and that's all you can ask for. And, again, like you said, they're going to be better. They will have played – West Virginia and Houston on the road. And those will be two really good games to teach a lot of these guys. You know, they played some young guys and it, mm-hmm. it's just going to be good experience and good building more continuity within this team. For me, I'm offensive line run blocking little yikes that <laughs> they weren't great. Like you look at the first half, right? 64 rushing yards on 13 carries. That's under five yards a carry against Tennessee Tech, like, that's not great. And the second half, it was kind of what you saw from Kansas defense last year where they wore down, and then eventually they couldn't stop. That was worrisome for me um, a little bit. And, again, continuity and getting the fuel for everything, you know, that'll help. But that, for me, was a little bit of a, a, okay, you got away with it against Tennessee Tech, but let's see what happens when you play that West Virginia front seven, which is scary. Um, well, and one more thing on that, mm-hmm. too. I mean, in, in the interest of, of fairness, against the Power 5 team, Devin Neal's not getting four carries. For sure. And yeah, that's very you're true. Not, and you're not very rotating true. those guys through to that extent that we saw last night. And so I think we're both of us are more commenting on, hey, exactly last night, like the execution, the things like that. Whereas you can look at it and say, well, okay, but KU wouldn't play – Duke like that because Devin Neal is going to get 15 plus carries probably. Yeah, that's fair. You're not going to rotate through your number seven linebacker as much against Duke as you did last night. And so those things should probably be pointed out too. Yeah. I I think that's a good point too. And again, continuity over time will help. Um, let's go here. Talking about some fan support here. Um, what do K fans you see over the next two weeks to carry the attendance momentum in the Duke game? I think for me, it's competent football. You know, I was texting with some of my friends last night, kind of who, who watched the game, and they were talking about, you know, oh, this is great. And it's like, well, this is competent football. This is yeah. what a competent football program looks like, which I don't think K fans are too used to seeing, honestly, in recent years. And this, they did what they're supposed to do in this game. Can they go to West Virginia and, and be competitive and be competent and not have a disastrous performance where they get blown out? Can you go to Houston? That's going to be really challenging. It's going to be hot. Houston's good. Um, can over these next two weeks, can they put together a competent product that at least builds some momentum in terms of feeling that the team is headed in the right direction and not doing a you know, you blew out a bad team and then you take kind of two steps back. Like, can they just continue to kind of take steps in the right direction, right? Be, you know, make it a one-score game against West Virginia. Make it so fans are watching in the fourth quarter. Same thing against Houston. Maybe can you lead against Houston at some point in the game? You know, can it be a little bit like maybe the Duke game last year where you come out, start real hot, and then maybe carry it over in the second half and now that you have more depth? I think in general, continuing to show that it's a competent product and a good product that fans want to watch. I think those are going to be the two big things. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I think that winning last night the way that they did also creates momentum. Yeah, and, for sure. And I think that a, lot, <clears throat> a lot of people had a uh, had a really good time last night. And I think that when we look at um, when we look at recent KU football history from an attendance standpoint, right? I feel like this fan base has really been yearning for for competent football and has been for yearning sure. for Um, something to give them an indicator that, hey, this is going to happen. And I feel like every time maybe that step has been taken, fans and fans have come out to Memorial, they haven't been rewarded for Mm -hmm. it. And and you look at, you know, the K-State game, um, what, again, in the Les Miles era, where you you have that great 
turnout for that K-State game and fans are excited and they feel like, okay, like maybe this is it. Maybe we're turning the corner and you go out and you aren't even competitive and the mm-hmm. game is, is over pretty much, you know, from, from the word go. And it's not even that Kansas needed to win that game, but Kansas needed to show something in that game. You know, if Kansas had lost to K-State in that game, say 24 to 17 or, or something like that, I think you would have continued to see that momentum build, but because, you know, they were like, well, I went to Memorial stadium and this is what I saw. This was my experience that, that hurt. And so I, I agree with you hundred percent. Like they want to see you know, against West Virginia and Houston. They want to see the clues that, Hey, this isn't like every other year. But I also think that last night's game with having the 35,000 fans there, who had a good experience, who saw Kansas looking like it did. I I think that that, you know, improved the momentum, you know, maybe even considerably from that as well. Yep. I agree. I think it's, it's what it's going to take. And I think you're right. Also those uniforms in 2019 made fans want to leave early too. I bet those were (laughs) awful. Um, All right. Let's wrap up here. Quick hit West Virginia. Did you watch the backyard brawl on Thursday? Uh, I watched it after the fact. So That's I was true. actually, I was with Ryan Wallace, you know, from, oh, of course, from, from yeah. our Kansas State site uh, over at the uh, the Lawrence High School game, uh, checking them out at, in Olathe South. Olathe South actually pulled off the upset and won 36 to 32. And um, Olathe South has uh, one of the top players in the state in Jordan Allen, who is a guy that, you know, was a KU target and everything. And, and so we went over and watched that. Um, I, I can tell you uh, phones were out <laughs> checking the score and everything. It was crazy. And that game was going on and, and came back home and I, I had it recorded. And nice. it, it was it was fascinating because I'm not sure either West Virginia or Pitt, if, if you were to pour Cruz Serum down both, both programs' throats, would say that they played well. And West Virginia still within the framework of that put itself in position to win and then just disaster <laughs> struck with, with the pick six and, and everything else. I think one of the things that stood out just real quick was um, JT Daniels didn't play especially well. He was hurt by wide receiver drops, I thought too. Uh, but that was one of the things I was looking at because I feel like West Virginia has got a really good front seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think West Virginia can run the ball with, with the guys that they have. And, and, you know, the the big back that they had against Pittsburgh, um, Donaldson, looked, uh, looked terrific. Yeah. The question for me is, can West Virginia throw the ball well enough to, to get people out? And in previous years, that's been a multifaceted problem for West Virginia because they haven't passed protected well. Like two years ago, I think they led the nation in drops, dropped passes. And, and, you know, obviously they didn't get terrific quarterback play there either, but it was all three things working together. And I think all of us thought JT Daniels with his ability, with the way he's played at certain times, you know, at at Georgia and USC, I think you felt like the quarterback problem I don't want to say it was solved, but there was there was a chance that they were going to play better at that position. Hmm. You wondered, could they protect him? And would the receivers, you know, do him more favors this year? It's one game, but I think that was one of the standouts to me is I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that passing game is, has maybe jumped to the level that they had hoped that, hmm. that it would. Interesting. I don't really agree. Like, I think yeah. uh, JT was pretty good. You know, obviously he doesn't really have a – he doesn't throw the ball in like a rope like an NFL quarterback yeah. like you see in college. But I thought his deep field accuracy was pretty good, and I just thought his wide receivers just kind of let him down. And they did I am that. interested to see those wide receivers against KU's defensive backs because that, yeah. that sounds – that's just – Gut instinct feels like that's a mismatch because those guys are a huge. Guy is really good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, so yeah, they've got good. some guys, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, JT wasn't as sharp, I think, as, as mm. I thought he would be, but um, uh, but no, I mean, it's it, it'll be it'll be interesting to watch for sure, and, and I think too that front seven against Kansas's run game, and, and it's 
you look at the game from last year, uh, just looking at West Virginia generally, and Kansas loses that game by a score. Kansas didn't have any running backs in that game. I mean, nobody was healthy. You know, Devin Neal had gotten hurt the previous week against TCU. Highshaw was out for the year. Obviously, Savion Morrison and Kai Thomas were playing for other schools, so they were they were not there. And I think when you look at West Virginia and Kansas coming out of that game, this game is obviously in Morgantown. It's a hostile environment. It's not an easy place to win. But I'm not entirely sure that you can't say that even with the addition of JT Daniels, that Kansas didn't do more to improve this offseason from last year's matchup than West Virginia did. And I think that's one of the things that, that makes this game interesting. Yeah, obviously to watch. I, I think there's a few matchups that just I'm I'm interested to write about this week because <laughs> I, I think the you know obviously I think just the trenches will be fascinating because Pitt Pitt's got some dudes and oh, they made West Virginia look bad. And I wonder, you know, how bad is West Virginia? Was that a more of a, you know, does that speak to how good Pitt was? Does that speak to how bad West Virginia? I don't know. So we'll have to see this week. But all righty, Kevin, that'll do it. Thank you as always for jumping on the podcast with us. Yeah, yeah, it was a uh, it was a good time. And uh, the, the Kansas Jayhawks are tied at the top of the Big 12. So, you know, it's uh, it, it is a solid week one result for the Jayhawks. Yeah, I, I got a question about the expanded playoffs, but I think we'll have to, we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit until later in the season to, to hit that one when KU's uh, what, 11 we, and now. I did get a Jalen Daniels Heisman Trophy question was overheard on the on the walk back to the car last night. Oh, I love that. I yeah. love I love week one overreactions. It's great. Oh, sure, sure. As always, stay tuned to uh, Fog.net for all sorts of KU basketball and KU football and recruiting coverage. If you like what you heard on the podcast, please leave it a rating and review. If you're watching on YouTube, head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Subscribe. If you're listening on the podcast platforms, head over to YouTube. Got a lot of YouTube content we're doing as well. Um, And thank you as always for listening. We'll talk to you guys again later this week to preview the West Virginia game.